as entrepreneurs, we all want to grow our business dramatically. And this is a real challenge. You know, we have to understand lessons from our fellow entrepreneurs, be able to bring it into our business, and we want to have them really work with remarkable entrepreneurs. And I have one today. And what I really love about him is, you know, not only is he a great entrepreneur, a great business person, but he's an attorney as well. And he understands, I mean, this is something that's so important for all of us, is that we've got to make our commerce, our business decisions. We've got to be able to serve our clients well. We've got to deliver value for them, and that's what creates value in, uh, for ourselves and our enlightened self-interest. In working with attorneys, a lot of times they're going to say, mm, no. And here, uh, you got to stay tuned. He's not only going to show you that it's not no, but how to focus, how to make it simple and elegant and really grow your business dramatically. I'm John Bowen. We are at AES Nation, accelerating your entrepreneurial success. Stay tuned. Ordinary success? No way. You want amazing, remarkable, exceptional breakthroughs. Dig deep, think bold, drive hard, watch yourself soar beyond your dreams. AESNation.com. So excited to have you here with me today. Uh, it's unusual. I don't, I, quite honestly, I don't have that many attorneys, and I have, we have a mutual friend, Jess, Jessica Rhodes, uh, who, and what I do have is more tax and estate planning, not a corporate side. And and Jessica said, you got to have Elliot on. He's phenomenal. And, you know, as we've gotten to know each other, as well as your book, which we're going to talk about a little bit later, I've been blown away with how you kind of mix those, that entrepreneurship and the legal and, and really provide some great insights. And I, I want to have you share your insights with our AES uh, Nation community. But before we do that, I, I'd like to get a little backstory because it's a little, you know, I mean, we're all weird. You know, I told you this before we turn on the camera, we're all a little weird, but the, uh, um, you know, being an attorney uh, and a successful entrepreneur, not as many out there, that's a small crowd. How'd you get there? Well, I'll, I'll tell you, because I, I was a business person first. I've started companies before I ever went to law school. But, you know, it comes down to this. I, when I graduated from law school um, all the way back in 1987, my sister gave me a coffee mug. And the coffee mug read, I'm a corporate attorney. I keep exciting things from happening. And I've kept that coffee mug around just to remind me what I'm not supposed to do. Because for the most part, when you're in business, and, and your audience knows this, when you're in business, a lot of times uh, legal is where great ideas go to die. And um, it doesn't have to be that way, especially if your thinking is entrepreneurial first, and then, well, let's, let's inform that uh, with legal training. No, I think, you know, I, I did read, Elliot, about your sister giving you that mug. And I, I, I hope there was a sense of uh, she was being a little ironic on the whole thing versus telling <laughs> yes. you what the future should be. But I mean, you really, you know, I, I think that one of the best training for all corporate attorneys would be yours. I mean, you go ahead and you go business first and then you understand that, you know, the challenges of an entrepreneur and then really coming back and getting that legal background, it's, it's, a, it's a really strong positioning. But I want to go right to the lessons because we want everybody here to get tremendous value. And you have something that I, I liked a lot. I mean, rule number one, it's pretty close to my rule number one, is make it easy. What are we talking about to our fellow entrepreneurs when you, 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 you know, kind of hit the table and rule number one, uh, make it easy? Well, it's, and everybody in my office knows what this is. It's rule number one, which is make it easy for people to do what you want them to do. And the example I gave you is if, if you want to get paid, if you know you want to get paid, but you decided that you were only going to accept certified checks, well, then you're putting a tremendous burden on your customers. They mean to pay you. They want to pay you on time. But, you know, they don't go into a bank. Nobody gets a certified check anymore unless you're buying a house. So your payments are going to be slow, they're going to be skipped, they're going to be put to the bottom of the pile because you didn't follow rule number one. And real quick, I'll just tell you, 
Um, I started crafting this because way back I had this two-door Honda Prelude and I parked in front of the circuit court for Anne Arundel County in Annapolis and I parked too long, I got a ticket, it was $50. And I looked on the ticket, which I meant to pay, and the ticket said, we don't accept checks and we don't take credit cards, and this was before online payment. They would only accept money orders. And I meant to pay it, and but I just never went into a bank. Who goes into a bank? And so a month went by, they sent me another bill, and it was the same $50. No interest, no cost, no penalties, <laughs> just 50 bucks. And again, I meant to pay it. And yet I did not. Cut to the chase. This went on for five years. Five years they sent me the same $50 bill. I had gotten rid of the car. The company that owned the car, which was one of my companies, was out of existence and no longer existed. And yet for five years they sent it to me. It was a sterling example of how to violate rule number one. Yeah, that's a great example. And, and in business, we, we so often do that. I mean, I, I think of one of my primary businesses is coaching financial advisors. And, and we charged uh, the coaching programs $24,000 per year. And initially, we would only take a couple different payments. And then we started to get a little more creative. And we pretty much took everything. And then, um, you know, we had... We wondered, you know, if we made it a little bit easier and just made it monthly payments and, you know, kind of a more of a su subscription model. And we, we found, we did a little test, and we never had any collection problem. And, it's, and, and business increased by about 25% by doing that. It, you know, it's, it's just these little things that, you know, we've got to understand our clients what they want and uh, make it easy, as you say. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you can tweak the business model so that um, if you know that, uh, for example, I know that I do my best work with a clear and open line of communication. Well, as a lawyer, if I start billing everybody $20 or $50 every time they pick up the phone, they're not going to pick up the phone all that often. And so I can't keep my finger on the pulse of the business. So I've got to tweak my business model to make sure I'm not penalizing people for doing what I want them to do. Um, a, another example is that everybody has a different way of consuming content. My youngest son, um, very curious about the world, very intelligent, um, he hates to read because he told me once he could articulate this, he can't hear the voices in his head of the characters or, or whatever when he's reading. What I figured out was he just voraciously consumes content through um, audiobooks because he likes to hear it. So if you want to coach people, if you want to teach people, if you want them to consume your content, make it easy for them. Account for the fact that there are different ways of consuming content among your clientele and make it easy for a whole host of people to embrace what you're, what you're teaching. Well, you know, this is great. And one of the, I want to go to the next, um, which it, kind of your son is a great example of this, that you know, so often you know, we're building businesses and we're, we're so busy doing it, doing it, doing it, that we never take the time to step back and look through what we're doing through the eyes of our best clients. And, um, you know, when you're we're working with your business, you know, the, you know, not only your business, but as you help other fellow entrepreneurs, that's something that's been really important to you. It has been. Um, early on, I got, I got a piece of advice that... Um, I really took to heart. Um, a friend of mine said, Elliot, your clients aren't you. They don't talk like you. They don't look like you. They don't think about what you think. They don't write like you do. The same things that keep you up at night don't keep them up at night. Um, and that's true. We have a tendency of thinking, well, if I like this, then everybody's going to like this. So what what you've got to do in your business is to see the world through somebody else's eyes. Really get inside the mind of your best clients, the people that you're trying to serve, the community you're trying to reach. See the world through their eyes. Because I'll tell you something, John, that I've learned at great cost. The golden rule is wrong. The golden rule is, is treat people the way you would want to be treated. And that's wrong. You have to treat people the way they want to be treated. And those are two very different things. 
No, that's great. I haven't heard it positioned that way before, Elliot, and I, I think that's, that's so true because, you know, we all have, we all come from our own backgrounds, our own biases, and, you know, we know how we want to be treated, but what we, uh, so for, for so many entrepreneurs, what the service we're providing, if we think of ourselves as a client, we're going to do it all wrong, and we've got to reach out and get a better understanding and, and really look through the eyes. And, and this is where, you know, kind of the, as we're going over rules that you have, you know, I'm going to call it rule number three is, you know, finding your best client or customer and starting that dialogue. And, and where, where are you going with that, Elliot? Well, the easy exercise is to go down your list of clients or your list of customers and just think to yourself, if you could wave a magic wand, who would you clone? Who would you get five of? Who would you get 10 of? Um, and the answer may differ depending upon you, you know, your likes. It might be that your best client pays you the most money or um, is the most receptive to your new product lines or allows you to do your most satisfying work, whatever that means to you, or maybe allows you to have the greatest impact on your community. Whatever criteria you establish, you figure out who your best client is, and then you laser focus on appealing to that group. But, you know, if you just hire somebody in marketing to do SEO or, you know, get your social media in shape and do ads or your website, and you haven't actually taken the time and expended the gray matter to figure out who your best clients are, you're wasting your time. It's like being a mile wide and an inch deep. You don't want to do that. Nobody wants to do that. Well, the thing that I like about this, and this is actually something that we teach in our coaching programs for financial advisors, because, you know, if you're, you're your best customers, for whatever reason, they feel that you're delivering value. Well, you want to understand that. And if you can, you know, and, and what the way I think of it is the four most powerful words in the English language. I need your help. If you go to your clients and you say, I need your help. I want to make sure I'm taking great care of you and people like you, but I, I need to understand, and the, depending on your product, your service, your solution, you know, having a series of questions, drilling down the insights that you get. I mean, you can go out, um, I've run research firms, and you know, we would charge you fifty thousand dollars to go out and ask your best clients these questions, you know, and right. uh, and uh, boy, it, there's value in that. I mean, we'd write it up really nice, put it in a nice brochure, and all that stuff. Or you could get a lot more value and actually have that conversation together. And they love having it. Yeah, they do. They love giving the advice. And you know what? You have to. There are two parts. One is you have to have the conversation, and I don't mean picking up the phone. I mean, seeing if you could sit down for coffee and listen. And you tell them right up front, I'm not asking to try and sell you something. I'm not asking you to write a bigger check to me. I want your advice. I need your help, exactly as you said. And then the second part of it is you act on it. So, for example, you know, I, I learned early on. Well, I talked to a marketing consultant a, a long time ago, and he said, that he was going to go out to talk to my clients. And I said, okay, but I know what you're going to find. I know that my clients come to me because I have this incredible legal expertise. I'm just a really, really good lawyer. Okay. So he goes out, and being a really good lawyer wasn't actually in the top five. What they liked was the fact that I returned my phone calls, that I'm accessible, that I speak English, you know, that, that meaning not legalese, but real live regular person English and I understand business because they assumed that I knew law. And so if you take that lesson, that means that in a typical lawyer's lawsuit or website, when they say, these are the lawsuits I've won and this is where I went to school and these are the legal briefs and cases that I've, I've taken on, nobody cares. You have to play to the strengths that your best clients perceive in you. So you have to have testimonials that says, you know what, Elliot's pretty darn responsive. Or I like talking to him because he understands my business. He's a business person first. That's what people care about. So you've not only got to take those conversations and make an effort to reach out to your clients, but then you've got to do something with it. 
because it's not enough just to nod your head and then move on to the next meeting. Well, I want to give two examples to Elliot because I, I think this is so important. It's easy to, to miss it. Um, when I was working in sports and entertainment as a, I was a CEO of the financial side of a pretty large organization, and we had 600 ultra affluent clients. Uh, most people would know maybe two thirds of the name or more. And I mean, there's some extremely famous, very successful individuals. And most were either in LA or New York uh, as their home base. And we surveyed a good portion of them to see you know, the value. And I mean, we handled all their personal finance. We you know, built their homes in the sense of you know, managing it. Uh, you know, got them, bought their cars, their uh, jets, their planes, you know, everything. Number one thing they loved was in L.A. that when it rained, their house leaked. They loved that we had a contractor on retainer to go out <laughs> and do it. And That's then, their need. That's right. Yeah, yeah, the second biggest thing was we paid their bills on time so they didn't get any late charges. Forget all the other glamorous things. And this is where, you know, it's, it's so easy. You go, you know, we don't know oftentimes what it is we do for our clients. And the, you know, let me give a, a second example, because I think this is a, a good one, and it relates to a lot of entrepreneurs. Uh, we, we work with a lot of financial advisors, and then we also have a matching service, matching successful business owners with the right vetted financial advisor. And so many financial advisors, in the U.S. there's 460,000 financial advisors, the, the, they're very investment-centric. Well, as business owners, you know, most of us want to invest a fair amount of capital in our business, and we're not quite as big as the rest of the world on that investment side. But, you know, as smart entrepreneurs, we have to maximize our personal wealth outside, so that gives us a lot of flexibility. Well, the way to do that is oftentimes sort of mitigating taxes and taking care of the heirs and making sure the asset protection stuff is there. Most advisors don't do that. And when we do the research and we survey business owners and share that, they're, they're kind of the advisors are blown away with that impact. And once they stop talking about investments and helping on the bigger picture of you know, helping these entrepreneurs become seriously wealthy, not because they're greedy you know, on the personal wealth side, but so that they can take care of the people they love and, uh, and really the causes they care about, you know, it's, it, there's a quantum jump in success. No, there, there absolutely is. I mean, I've been called in by investment banks and even valuation firms before, not just to talk about the legal aspects of what they do, but one called me and just to look over their proposals because their proposals would have here's our valuation methodology and here's how we choose this and here's how we choose that and you know what and here are our biographies and and here are our founders and here's the letter from the president but you know what they didn't put up certainly not front and center and i don't even think it was in this particular proposal at all was exactly what you were saying here's yeah. how we pay the bills on time here's how we protect your legacy wealth here's how you're going to provide for your children and your children's children um, everything else is commentary I'm going to solve your problem. So that's two two issues. Number one, I know what your problem is. Well, I understand. Well, let problem. me stop you just for a second there, because I think, Elliot, that's so fundamentally important. Most people, you know, most entrepreneurs, we're not clear what the problem is that we're solving. And if we can let that prospective client or our client know that, that you know, that that takes care of so much. Yeah, it does, because you've already broken down that educational barrier of why do I need you? Tell me why I need you, because I'm going to solve your problem. Because here's the thing, John. People don't buy drills. They buy holes. You know, if if I want to put up cabinets in my garage, so I got to drill through the concrete and I got to go to Home Depot and I see a whole aisle of drills talking about torque and talking about different models and how long the battery life is. But I'm not buying a drill, John. I'm buying holes. I want the holes in that concrete so that I can put up those cabinets. And too many people in their proposals spend all the time in the world talking about the drill. Yeah, and how nice it is and how good I handle it and all that. And right. yeah, and it, it's really um, one of the things is uh, I just turned 60 and I, I think I, find, I wish I knew what I knew uh, now, you know, in my 30s because I would be a lot less confident. And, 
you know, really, it's it's very. I was a lot smarter in those days too, Elliot. And, <laughs> yeah, you and me both. Yeah, and, and the the key thing that I think that it is all we do all kinds of research in our businesses. I'm surveying tens of thousands of people each year, and I used to give all the statistics and isn't this great. You know, the, the end of the day is exactly, you talked about the hill, people want the result. That's all they want. And so once we know what they, you know, their concerns are, whatever you're addressing, and you can then articulate how you're going to get the results for them, and it's not about you, it's about them and the, you know, the satisfaction they're going to have going forward, you're going to do great. But let, let me switch to, uh, you know, number four, is, uh, having a place for your best customers to go. What is that? Well, it means that once you've identified your best customers and you've talked to them and you know um, what what their problem is and the solution you're providing, you've got to you've got to create a way for them to find it very easily. And so it doesn't just mean a website, but it means that there's an environment. So you take my world. In my world, I represent. I serve as general counsel to small businesses all over the country. And if somebody wants to hire me as general counsel to do a certain number of things, at some point, they're going to have to sit in my conference room or um, figuratively like we are or literally physically. And they're going to have to make a decision to write me a check. Now, meeting me at a networking event or meeting me over coffee and writing a check, there's a big gap between those two things. So you've got to create a way to form the relationship. So. For example, we have um, very intermediate steps. Tomorrow night, as a matter of fact, I, I have a number of events for my law firm. I wanted to combine the substance of a lunch and learn with the informality of a happy hour. So about once a month, I have things called drink and thinks. And my drink and thinks pull in people of influence or people of um, interest to my best clients just to hear them. They don't want to hear a lawyer talk all the time, so just to hear them. So next month, for example, we've got a, somebody coming in on solving business problems with Legos. And it's a really cool presentation. But um, I create a way for my best clients, I create an environment where they want to be, I create a way for them to come in. Nobody's going to see what they can do to put them in a used car today. There's no sales tactic. There's no high pressure. But I create a place for them to start to get to know me. And I create a way for them, little by little, to inch closer into my circle so that um, we can develop a relationship which, in the fullness of time, may result in an attorney-client relationship. It may not. And it's just somebody that's a great person to have in my network. But you've got you've to create a place for those people to go. Now, this is so important, Elliot, because what it is, you know, I want to think of it, I think of it this overall marketing. And what I mean by, to me, marketing is all about starting a conversation, starting that relationship. And the more we can understand our clients, we've talked about, you know, really getting clear who our best clients are, having that conversation, and then making, you know, this comfortable place for them to come to have these conversations, develop that deeper relationship, not to manipulate them, but to gain a better understanding so that we can serve them and right. do, you know, so much more value. And, and, you know, people are running workshops and seminars and all this to sell and pitch and so on. And this is, you know, the, the classic lunch and learn. I do like uh, drink and think. I mean, <laughs> I'm going to go to yours before, <laughs> but yeah, the, the the part I I wonder as you're, you know, as we're thinking about this, you know, is you know I would challenge every other entrepreneur, you know, whatever business you're in, is you know how can you make it easy to come together? I mean, there's so many different types of events that you can do. Yeah, there are, and you know, one of the one of the keys, and I think this is so hard to do, but it's to forget about the first person. You know, so so don't do your website that's focused on I and we, but make it a mirror so that your best client can see themselves in it. Don't do your events that are focused on I and me, you know, because 
look, I know you work with a lot of financial planners. Well, how many of them will have these things that say, okay, well, if you come to my office then, or come to a restaurant, um, then you can hear me talk about my thoughts about retirement. Okay, I, I get that, but it's still about you. It's still about, I know if I go, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to listen to a sales pitch. Maybe an informative sales pitch, but it's a sales pitch. But if it's about me, if it's not, so for example, if a financial planner says, hey, Elliot, you know, I know that, that your son is 17, he's a, you know, your oldest is 17, he's a rising senior. I know you've probably got questions about paying for college. I'm going to bring in an expert in this, and you know what? It's not a sales pitch at all. I'm, they're not looking to be a client, whatever. They're just going to educate you on different financial aid that may be available or different scholarships that you can apply for and the different steps you can take. Well, you know what? I'm all ears. Even if there is a little bit of a sales pitch, I'm all ears because they identified a problem that I have. And it's not just calling me into their meeting so they can talk about the thing that they want to talk about. No, and that, that is so much. I mean, we, we, you know, we're all so busy to the extent that we can really get exposed to things that cause us concern and potential solution. There's so much value. And um, so often that introduction, Elliot, you know, that just cements the relationship. Even if there was no business, that value added that you brought yeah. is huge. I want to go one last uh, key takeaway, uh, you know, lesson learned that you had. And, and this is one that I think is counterintuitive to a lot of people is, you know, going outside your industry for strategies, tactics, and ideas. No, I want to be the best attorney or the best financial advisor or best widget maker. I should go to my industry conferences. Uh, why, why do you tell your, your entrepreneurial peers this? Well, recently I went to a, a, um, uh, an expo and one of the sponsors was a law firm. And so naturally I was drawn to the law firm table and I looked at their brochures and their brochures were gorgeous, John. I got to tell you that, I mean, the paper had a higher thread count than my sheets. The <laughs> font was perfect. The images were great. It was, it was great. It was terrific. But I knew that if you wiped away that firm's logo and put another firm's logo right in there, it wouldn't make a darn bit of difference. Because it didn't, they didn't differentiate themselves. What they tried to do was be the very best law firm brochure they could possibly be. Who cares? You know, if you want to be great at customer service, if you want to micromanage your client experience, go see what the Ritz-Carlton is doing. Go see if you, if you like um, an experience that you had, whether it's at the Apple store or whether it's at some craft show. Go think about and take apart what they're doing, and then do the do um, do that. And a, a good way to think about it is also the opposite. Everybody has a series of horror stories. If I said to you, you know, hey, can you can you think of a, just a horror story in retail, a time when you walked into a store and they just blew it? It was just just a bad experience that you had. Could be a restaurant, could be retail, could be a service business, whatever. And if you start unpacking that and write down the details and just do the opposite of that, you're well ahead of yourself. But don't restrict yourself to your industry. You don't want to be the tallest of the seven dwarves. You want to look outside to the strengths in any industry and see how you can incorporate that into what you're doing. That's how you stand out. Now, and this one, I really am a big believer in, Elliot. I, I spent 100000 a year, a little over that being parts of mastermind groups, CEO groups that are outside of the financial services industry because there's so many good ideas out there that I would never see if I wasn't in there. I mean, you know, you can, you know, definitely, uh, you can pick up a book. You can go to the Ritz Carlton. You, you know, one of the things, you know, observe everything, but also I'm a big believer in not leaving anything to chance because, you know, hanging out with other fellow entrepreneurs who are going in different directions, but are having success, so many lessons. But you know what, I want to go to uh, one of the best ways of getting knowledge in my mind is uh, books. Uh, 
best deal out there. And we have a segment called Book of the Day, Elliot. And I, I'm pulling up on the screen, uh, Amazon, your new book, uh, Fire Aim Ready. And, uh, you know, and, and I thought it was Ready Aim Fire. But anyways, uh, <laughs> it's not a typo. Why don't you tell no, us a not. little tell us a little bit about the book and uh, you know why your fellow entrepreneurs uh, should really be reading this? Well, Fire Aim Ready is built on the uh, Stephen Covey approach to start with the end in mind. But where he might talk about bullet points or figure out your end goal, this is you have to tell the whole story. So I'll give you a, a quick example. If if my client calls me and says, "Look, I want to." I'm thinking about signing this contract. My first question is going to be, okay, let's assume that you do. Explain to me why in six months you're going to pick up the phone and call me asking me to help you get the heck out of that contract. What is it that's going to cause you to want to break and run? Let's go through, let's tell the story. And as we go through all of these things, then I say, okay, now we know how to write the termination, how to write the protection clauses, how to write the escape patches into the contract, because we've told the story of the end. If you're joining a partnership, you can say, all right, here are the two questions. What would make you, in three years, turn to your spouse and say, you know what? Joining into a partnership with that guy was the best thing I ever did. Let's tell that story. What does that look like? Mm -hmm. And then conversely, how does it look when it, end, when it ends? What would make you want to get out, want to get him out? What, um, how do you see this coming apart? And then let's write the script on how that happens. So you fire first, meaning that you have to envision the shot first. And then having envisioned and told the story of the end, then you can aim and get your company ready. So it's a fire aim ready management is the first in a four ebook series that deals with four aspects of business, management, contracts, partnership, and people. And so management tells you how to recruit, how to um, form a company culture, how to stand out. Some of the things that we've talked about here in terms of standing out from your competition, um, looking through other people's eyes, and really forming your company as the best it can possibly be. No, I love it. I love the subtitle. I want to just read it because this is, you know, this fire aim ready management, uh, you know, the start, the start at the end approach to crushing competition. I mean, it's just, it is so powerful when you understand that crafting the culture and cementing the relationships. So encourage everybody to reach out. And again, we'll have the links. If you're driving, you know, don't uh, try to write this stuff down. Uh, go to a, yeah, aesnation.com. We'll have the show notes, the links for everything that we're talking about. Let me go to the next section, which is resources, Elliot. And, and let me pull up your website and tell us a little bit about, you know, this, um, what you have at the Farsighted Business uh, website. Yeah, the Farsighted Business is the platform that reaches out beyond Maryland. So it talks about my my speaking, I speak internally to uh, companies and also, of course, to conferences and things regionally and nationally. I do consulting work. I have a blog um, that's now um, on Huffington Post. Um, and so I, I um, and then, then books, of course. And so through Farsighted Business, it allows me to expand my platform. And then um, my law firm is Wagenheim Law at Wagenheim.com. And that really tells more of a story of individual work with clients um, as an attorney. Uh, this is great, and this has been so useful. Let me go to the last segment. I, you know, I, I want to pull together and just kind of what I, I always think of the key takeaways and what I'm going to do with the lessons that Elliot is sharing with us because these are so important. It's all about accelerating our entrepreneurial success, and this is a big deal. I mean, rule number one uh, he shared, make it easy. This is, I have kind of, I have three words that we're running for our business. It's focus, simple, and elegant. An easier way to say it is easy. I mean, that's, you just, you make it easier for your clients. That keeps you focused. Make it simple and elegant. So often as entrepreneurs, we can make things complicated. Look through the eyes of your best clients. I mean, these are so powerful. They're, they're simple concepts, but I, I'll tell you, in the heat of being a business owner, an entrepreneur, 
we forget those. What, you know, what is your best client? What are they seeing? Okay, what do you see when you look out? And then find those best customers and talk with them. Interview them. You know, pretend like you're a market research person. Use that. The four most powerful words in the English language is, I need your help. If they're a good client already, customer, they're going to be more than happy to share. And they're going to oftentimes point you in a different direction. Create a venue, a place for your customers to go to hang out with you. Uh, one of my uh, good business friends, uh, uh, he was just starting to have success. And he put an event together for his top clients and spent $500,000 to do this in London. He invited me and I, I'm going, David, I think you're crazy. This is just unbelievable. Uh, well, anyways, David goes, John, you know, the amount of revenue that will come out of this by hanging out with my top clients, this will be so worth it. Uh, David went on to be a multi-billionaire. So hold those events. <laughs> you know, I, I, David would probably say that's one of the key reasons. And the, the last rule, Elliot, that you shared is looking outside the industry. Yeah, don't, you know, don't try to be the best of whatever you're doing. Go outside. We need to each make ourselves distinctive. And one of the best ways is bringing something from outside the industry. Elliot, I want to thank you. This has been invaluable. I want to encourage everybody to go and point to our website, aesnation.com, to take these lessons, you know, download the transcript, highlight these rules, and make sure you're putting them into action. Your current clients and all those future clients, they're counting on you. Don't let them down. Wish you the best of success. Exceptional, remarkable breakthroughs. AESNation.com